That was really, really nice. Thanks for putting that together. Let's bow our heads as we prepare to get into God's Word this morning. Loving Heavenly Father, we are grateful uh, that you love us. And no matter what part of this world we have ancestry, we're grateful, Jesus, that you came down to save all of us. We're grateful uh, that someday we'll all be um, with you in person in your heavenly kingdom, uh, your universal kingdom, and we look forward to that day. Speak to our hearts as we open your word this morning in Jesus' name. Well, if you were here last Sabbath, you may recall me telling you to read ahead. Uh, Acts chapter 10 and 11 through verse 18. We're not going to read all the verses today because it's a rather lengthy passage, but I'll start by summarizing the story in case you didn't read it. There was a guy who was a centurion, a Roman centurion named Cornelius. He was a God-fearing man, and he sent a delegation, a group of people, to go find Peter. Meanwhile, while they're traveling to Peter, Peter had a very strange vision, seemingly about food, and he didn't understand what it was about. However, the group arrived, and they were asking Peter to come with them to the nearby town of Caesarea, which was about 30 miles away. Peter eventually goes with them, and he meets, he meets Cornelius's family, who are Gentiles, and now he understands the vision or actually a little bit before then, and he preaches the gospel to them. While this happens, the Holy Spirit falls on this group of people, and Peter says, you got to be baptized. How can we hold back baptism from you? And in the end of the story, Peter defends God's grace as the Jerusalem church had some questions about what he had done in regards to the Gentiles. And in the end, the whole group ends up praising God for his grace. So that's the big overarching summary of the story. But I think the details that we're going to dig into this morning will be very interesting and may help you understand parts of this story a little bit better. So in Acts chapter 1, or chapter 10, I want to start in verse 1. And it says, There was a certain man in what town? Caesarea. This, as you'll recall, is the place where Philip the Evangelist stopped and kind of set up, apparently, his ministry headquarters. So Philip had been doing evangelism in this town before this delegation was ever sent by Cornelius. Cornelius, it says, had what occupation? A centurion. And you might notice the word cent or century in there. That relates to the number 100. He was a Roman officer. He was not a Jew. He was a Gentile, over about 100, or usually more like 80 men from what was called the Italian regiment. But even though he was a Gentile, how does verse 2 describe him in character? What sort of man was he? A devout or a God-fearing man. He feared God with his whole household, and he gave alms generously If you haven't used the word alm this week, it just means he gave money for the poor. He gave generously, and he prayed to God always. This guy may not have been raised a Jew, but he sure loved the God of the Jews. And it says in verse 3, about the ninth hour of the day, that's a typical Jewish time for prayer. This is about 3 p.m. in the afternoon. He clearly saw in vision an angel of God coming to him and saying, Cornelius. So this man received a vision and saw an angel. And when he observed him, he said, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging with who? Simon, the tanner. Remember, living with a tanner was kind of a little bit on the edge for for Judaism, but we saw Peter opening up uh, gradually to people who weren't living strictly as he was raised. He's with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who had spoken to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. 
So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. So he gets a vision. He sends a couple of his uh, loyal friends and, and followers, people who are um, under his charge, to Joppa, which is about 30 miles away. So this, this journey takes a bit of time. Meanwhile, we get to the next scene, which is in verse 9. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. He became very hungry and wanted to eat, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance, and he saw heaven opened, and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descended to him and let down to the earth. Now, what was in this sheet? Verse 12 says, In it were all kinds of four-footed animals from the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds from the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill, and eat. Now, just think about this for a moment. You're Peter. You've grown up in a strict Jewish environment. You understand that God says there are certain kinds of animals that are called clean, those ones you can eat. The ones that are unclean, you do not eat. But what is in the sheet? What kinds of animals are in the sheet given by the description? There are certainly unclean animals, uh, but since it says all kinds, we, are, we assume that there also were clean in the mix as well. But Peter objects. He says, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or, or defiled or impure or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again a second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven. Kind of a weird vision to have. Uh, an odd one to see. Now, as a bit of a side note, before we go any further, there are some people who teach that in Mark 7 and in other parallel passages, Jesus did away with the clean and unclean distinction. Jesus purified all foods. That's what they teach. But that doesn't make sense because five years later, Peter, who was there for Jesus to explain those things in Mark 7, Peter still has a habit of eating the foods that are clean and avoiding the foods that are unclean. Uh, if Jesus had somehow taught otherwise or changed things while, while he was in his ministry, Peter should have said, okay, Lord, since you have cleansed all foods, even the unclean animals, I will eat at your command. But instead, Peter is still staying with his convictions. But nevertheless, it is kind of an odd vision. And before we continue the rest of the story, there are three important big concepts that I want to take a look at briefly. The first is, is the question, as many people say, was this vision, was the purpose of the vision to... to make it so that pigs and other unclean animals were now okay to eat. That's commonly an interpretation of this vision, but I think there are some good reasons that I'll explain now and even will become more clear later why that's not the purpose or even a side teaching of the vision. First of all, uh, the, the sheet contained both clean and unclean animals. So when Peter was commanded to, to rise, kill, and eat, he certainly could have had his pick from any of the animals. The voice didn't say, kill and eat every single animal. He had a choice. So he could choose whether he picked a clean one or an unclean one. Uh, furthermore, as you read the story, the voice from heaven never even mentions unclean animals, but only addresses Peter's calling of certain kinds of animals as common or impure. Um, furthermore, when you look at the story, Peter, there's no evidence that he changed his dietary habits after this experience. But what does start to change immediately is the way Peter relates to people. Peter understands that the, the point of the story, of the, the vision that he had, was all about people, and it wasn't actually about food. It was a parable, if you will. Uh, and... and Another important point, it's in verse 15 when it says, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. The Greek tense there uh, 
without diving deep into the weeds of Greek grammar, it basically refers to an action that has already been completed in, the, in a definite point in the past. So the Greek grammar excludes the possibility that, that in those statements and in this vision, God was cleansing these animals. Uh, it would have had to have happened already, but Peter didn't know anything about it. Um, Jesus didn't make any clear statement, uh, as I would argue about it. And Peter didn't make any changes um, about it. Uh, and then later on, at the end of the story, when the people from Jerusalem confront Peter about his interactions with the Gentiles, they say nothing about his change in dietary practices, but rather they ask him about him hanging out with the Gentiles. Uh, and, and finally, as more of a pragmatic point, if pigs and those sorts of things weren't healthy before this vision, they certainly didn't become healthy afterwards. So for these reasons and more, uh, the vision is not telling Peter and, and the rest of us that pigs are now uh, a clean animal to eat. So that's the first issue. The second issue is, what was the historical background between the relationships of Jews and Gentiles? Uh, and you can probably guess that it wasn't that great. There were some racial tensions, some ethnic tensions, some religious differences. Uh, and I want to put a couple of things up on the screen here, a couple of quotations. Um, here is one from an, a book that was written in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's not scripture, but it does give interesting information regarding the beliefs during those days. This is from the book of Jubilees, chapter 22, verse 16, and it says, these instructions say this, separate thyself from the nations and eat not with them. Don't eat with them and do not do according to their works and become not their associate, for their works are what? Unclean, and all their ways are a what? Pollution and a what? An abomination and uncleanness. Are you getting the picture that they didn't want Jews to hang out with non-Jews? Yeah, that's pretty clear. Uh, or, or notice this next one. This was from a second century rabbi. And he, he had this to say. Talking about uh, Jews going to a wedding that was put on by a non-Jew. If a non-Jew prepared a wedding feast for his son and sent out to invite all the Jews in his town, even if they have their own food and their own drink, and have their own servant waiting at them, what are they doing? Worshiping idols. So the rabbi is saying, hey, even if, even if you have your own little part there at potluck, and your own servants there, and your own food, you are still worshiping idols by going to that wedding. Now, the reality is, this is not the only view that existed within Judaism. There were other views that were more open, um, more flexible, but this was a, certainly a dominant one. And, and I'll, I'll put another verse here on the screen because Peter and the church in Jerusalem seems to share this viewpoint, or at least something similar. Acts 10, verse 28. You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or, with, or go to one of another nation. Peter couldn't hang out with the Gentiles because he would become defiled, uh, an idol worshiper, through association. Now, it's important for us to understand, sometimes we, we look back and we criticize and we say, wow, they were so close-minded. And we ourselves can have the same kinds of th things and ideas and behaviors. We get comfortable with people who just are like us. Uh, you know, even at pastor's meetings, I, I have to pick on my own self, I, at, at pastor's meetings with other pastors, it's so easy for me to only hang out with the pastors that are from my area or the rock climbing pastors instead of making new friends, right? Church, you're guilty of the same thing, right? You go to potluck, well, let me just sit with the people I always sit with, right? And it's not a prejudice thing, it's just a, it's just a comfort thing. Um, in big and small ways, we have area for growth. Oh, I don't want to hang out with or talk to my Christian um, neighbors, they're from another denomination. Or they're from that church. 
or they're not even church-going people. I can't talk to them. How are we supposed to be a witness if we can't talk to people who don't think the same way we do? You might learn something, uh, something that can help you in your Christian journey. So we have to be very careful uh, about this, but this illustrates the concept. In Peter's day, boy, you don't hang out with Gentiles. And Anita, I'm so thankful that you're willing to hang out with us. You enrich our lives uh, a lot. Okay, so that's the second part. We need to understand that element. The final part is there's a word that you may have noticed. Some of your Bibles, it says the word common. Others, it may say impure. Um, What God has cleansed, you must not call common. What in the world does this word common mean uh, or impure? It's actually the Greek word koinos or koinao, which can mean common, ordinary, impure, or defiled. And it's a different word than the word that's used to talk about unclean animals. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, there's a word for unclean animals, and it's akathartos. And akathartos is always used in connection with unclean animals. It's uh, koinos is never ever once used to refer to unclean animals. I'll put it on the screen here for you. Uh, koinos can relate to things that are just common and ordinary or uh, maybe defiled through association. So remember the quotes about don't go to the wedding because if you do, you're worshiping idols. Guilty by association. That's kind of this idea. Impure, simply through close contact. Um, Akathartos was something that was unclean or impure uh, and can relate to more of the permanent states of impurity. Uh, The unclean animals in the Old Testament, for example, there was never a way for them to become purified. They were always considered unclean. Whereas if somebody touched a dead body and they were temporarily defiled, that could go away over time. So with those words in mind, it's interesting because in the books written in between the Old and the New Testament, things like 1st Maccabees and 4th Maccabees, we see this word koinos being used. And it's really not used much. In fact, you can't find koinos used in this way outside of Palestine. Uh, The Greek writers didn't use it in this way. It seems to have uh, a term that's been coined, shall we say, in Palestine. Uh, And it kind of relates to this um, impure by association. Uh, being defiled through close connection uh, or simply through, uh, you know, common everyday things. Something that's clean can become impure by its connection. Um, And this shows itself in in examples like if you're a Jew and you hang out with a Gentile, you have become defiled and impure. Or if you go to a market and you buy a loaf of bread or a flask of oil from a Gentile vendor— that really, you really shouldn't consume that in this strict way of thinking because it has become impure. Even though it's good bread and good oil, uh, you shouldn't consume it. That was the, the mindset of Peter and the Jerusalem church in his day. Um, understanding the difference between koinos and akathartos really helps unlock a couple Bible passages because sometimes the translators, for whatever reason, took the word koinos and translated it as unclean, which has a different meaning. For example, uh, I'll put up on the screen Mark chapter 2, this, or Mark 7 verse 2. This story is sometimes misunderstood about this issue, but it says, now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled or koinos hands, that is with unwashed hands, they found fault. So they're eating just regular bread, but their hands haven't been purified in the ritualistic manner that was necessary according to the Pharisees. And so the Pharisees said, it's all defiled. And then Jesus went on and gave a little speech about how it's not what comes into the body that defiles someone ritualistically, it's having a bad heart that truly defiles someone. So the issue was not about clean, unclean issues. This was about ritual purity uh, versus 
um, having a pure heart. Or what about in Romans chapter 14? Sometimes this passage is misunderstood. It says there, the Apostle Paul said, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. That's not the word akathartos, which refers to unclean animals. That's the word koinos, which refers to things that are defiled by association. Uh, nothing is unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him is unclean. So what's going on in Paul's day? Well, someone goes to the market and they buy a flask of oil from a Gentile. Someone else in the church says, that's, that's bad, that's unclean, you shouldn't eat that. You shouldn't use that in cooking. Paul's saying, hey, do what you're convicted of. But he wasn't going to sweat that. You know, you, you buy some lentils from uh, a vendor, but they had an idol in their shop. This is food that has now been in the presence of idols. Those lentils are, in some minds, koinos. They're common. They're impure, unclean. Uh, so understanding the difference here helps uh, us avoid some misunderstandings uh, on this topic. But let's get back to Acts chapter 10. So having these three things in mind helps us better understand what's going on. Peter has a sheet that is dropped down before him, and it has all manner of animals on it. Some of them are clean, some of them are unclean. But as Peter looks at the sheet, there's been a mixture of the two kinds of animals. And so in Peter's mind, can he eat the clean animals that have been next to the unclean ones? No. Because he would become unpure, impure in the process. In fact, uh, the great Scottish scholar, F.F. F. Bruce, he's no longer alive, great, famous Christian scholar, he said this, it has been asked at times whether Peter could have killed and eaten one of the clean animals, but he was scandalized by the unholy what? Mixture of the clean animals with the unclean. This particularly, is particularly important when we recall the practical way in which he had to immediately apply the lesson of the vision. So Peter's like, no, I can't eat. I've never eaten anything that is unclean or common. So it wasn't the voice telling him, eat these unclean foods. Uh, there was something else that was going on, a spiritual lesson about people was about to happen. Look at verse 17. While Peter wondered within himself what the vision had meant, if it was a literal, uh, literal vision, he probably would have gotten it quicker. He was wondering, what does this mean? Two men sent from Cornelius made their inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate. So now we have two Gentiles come knocking. While Peter is thinking about the vision, Peter's got a choice to make. Do I go and interact with them? Will this make me impure if I do so? What's going on? Um, verse 19, while Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, and go down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. It's okay, Peter. He's still thinking about this vision. What does this mean? And then he's confronted with a choice. And what does he decide? Verse 21, Peter went down to the men who had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, I'm the one who you seek. For what reason have you come? And then verse 23, then he invited them in and lodged them. So he's now under the same roof with them. He's now sharing meals with them. He's hanging out with them because he's beginning to get the message of the vision. And the message was simple. These walls that have been set up, dividing people. Jesus said, I've knocked them down. There is no wall. Peter, you know, how are you going to spread the gospel to the world if you can't interact with the world? It's impossible. This was a very important concept that they needed to get. And so Peter goes with them the next day. He meets Cornelius. And then we get to verse 28, which we partially quoted already. It says, then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company or go with one from another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So it wasn't about pigs. It was about people. Peter's recognizing 
He shouldn't be separating himself. He needed to be with people in order to reach them. Now, of course, it is true. The Bible does say evil company does corrupt. Uh, And we don't want to hang out with people that are bringing us down and getting us into bad choices. But there's a different mindset when you're associating with people in order to be a blessing and a Christian witness to them. It's very different. Um, And we're called to be the salt of the earth. And Peter is starting to get this. Verse 29, Therefore I came without objection as soon as I was sent for. And he asks, what am I here for? Cornelius goes on to describe in the next few verses his experience and the vision that he had. And then Peter, in verse 34, begins to speak. And notice what he says. Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. Our God is a fair and a loving God that loves each of us as much as he loves anybody else. You remember that story before the children of Israel crossed over to go take down Jericho? You remember the commander there uh, had a vision or saw an angel, a, a massive angel, a man of war, standing there before him, and he says, are you with us or for our enemies? And you remember how the heavenly messenger responded? What did he say? He said, neither. I'm, I'm, and I forget the exact details because I didn't plan to, to say these things exactly. But you look it up on your own. He said, I'm not on either side. God is for all of us. And on International Sabbath, it's an opportunity for us to reflect on how God is working in all parts of the world. God has brought together a beautiful collage of backgrounds and cultures and peoples and foods and and how beautiful it is because God has told us there should be no wall of separation. We shouldn't view other people as being unclean. We shouldn't view ourselves as becoming liable to become unclean or impure through association. All people have been saved by the blood of Jesus. Whoever is saved, and so Peter says, in truth, I, show, uh, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. And Peter goes on to preach the gospel to Cornelius and to his household. And while he's still speaking, the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit fell on those people and they started to speak in tongues. They were manifesting this gift of languages from the Holy Spirit And it was an obvious physical um, evidence that Jesus had blessed and was working in the lives of even these Gentiles. So Peter, verse 47, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who just received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized, verse 48, in the name of the Lord. And they asked him to stay a few days. Peter realized the Holy Spirit wasn't just for the Jews. The Holy Spirit, God's active agent in this world, is for everybody. You know, the Holy Spirit and God's working and blessings, it's not just for Seventh-day Adventists, is it? God wants to work in every person's heart, no matter where they worship, no matter where they find themselves living. God doesn't simply want to only bless America. Do you think God wants to bless other nations too? God wants everyone to come to accept and follow him. I almost titled the sermon God's International Kingdom, but then I realized, wait, no, no, God is the God not only of this earth, but of the universe. It's a kingdom that extends far beyond the boundaries that we've established here in our world. It goes everywhere. Someday we'll get to explore that kingdom. Um, And won't that be awesome? Exploring the universe with the God who saved us. Now, as we wrap up here, the brothers, the leaders in Jerusalem, they were 
a little interested to find out, okay, now what did you just do and who were you with, Peter? Because they hadn't received the vision that Peter had had. But Peter retells the story. He tells how God changed his understanding and how the Holy Spirit fell on them. And in the end, it, it's beautiful. Verse 18 of chapter 11, our last verse. When they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God, saying, God has also granted the Gentiles repentance to life. They praised God. Brothers and sisters, those of you watching from home now or, or some point in the future, God wants the people of this planet to know that he's coming back. God wants the people of this planet to know that he's a good God and a loving God, and he wants them to experience the love of Christians like you and me. But we can't do that if we have walls in our heart that separate us from others. Maybe it's walls of prejudice. Maybe it's walls simply because we're a little bit timid. We're a little bit shy. It's easy. It happens to me. I would witness, but I'm, I'm shy right now, God. Uh, later. Whatever the wall is in your heart or mind, God can and will help us overcome it. The good news is too good to keep to ourselves. It's meant to be shared. So as we close this morning, think in your own life if there's anything you need to, to lift up to God and ask him to help you with. Because in the same way that God helped Peter to overcome his prejudice and his misunderstandings theologically, God can help do the same thing for us too. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we're grateful that while we were still sinners, Jesus, you died for us. Give us a love for souls like you have for us. Give us opportunities this week to be a blessing and to share the goodness of God with others. And Lord, if there, if there are any obstacles in our heart, any patterns of, of prejudice or bias, or, or just we're stuck in a rut hanging out with the people we're used to hanging out with and we're not thinking about others, open our minds. Give us eyes to see as you see. And this week, use us to make friends for you. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a happy Sabbath. And just head on down to our international celebration.